Chapter 4.6 Creating Abstract Power The truth is, one who seeks to achieve freedom by petitioning those in power to give it to him has already failed, regardless of the response. To beg for the blessing of authority is to accept that the choice is the master's alone to make which means that the person is already by definition a slave. Larkin Rose, Reference 99 Chapter 4.6.1 To wield abstract power over people, convince them they need your permission or approval. To seek permission or social approval from someone is to tacitly give them abstract power over you. On the flip side, if you want to create and wield abstract power over a large population of humans, simply convince them to adopt a belief system where they need permission or social approval from you. Once a population believes they need your permission or approval, you have successfully gained abstract power and influence over them. It should be noted that abstract power is a relatively new phenomenon. Evidence of abstract power appears quite recently in the human fossil record. An easy way to detect when humans started believing in abstract power is when they started giving some sapiens far more materially grandiose burial rituals than other sapiens. Pre-Neolithic society appears to have been largely rankless, with what anthropolo anthropologist Peter Turchin describes as remarkably cooperative and egalitarian societies with leaders who could not order their followers around leading instead by example. Reference 22. For hundreds of thousands of years, humans lived in rankless societies like this, with very few distinctions beyond age, gender, and earned reputation. Everyone had a simu similar burial ritual. Reference 68. Then starting in the Neolithic age, after the invention of agriculture, Disproportionately, gaudy graves emerged, packed full of gold and other precious resources. God kings wielding enormous amounts of reified abstract power emerged. Not surprisingly, they exploited people with their imaginary power. As Turchin describes, they oppressed us, enslaved us, and sacrificed us on the altars of bloodthirsty gods. They filled their palaces with treasures and their harems with the most beautiful women in the land. They claimed to be living gods and forced us to worship them. Reference 22. Based on nothing more than artifacts dug up from the ground, we can observe that several thousand years ago, people suddenly learned that they could psychologically exploit their peers through their mutual adopted belief systems, and they've been doing it ever since. Somewhere along the path of sapient abstract thinking and cultural evolution, the practice of storytelling went from Paleolithic shamans describing the mysteries of the afterlife and imbuing the tribe with symbolic meaning to god kings using rhetoric and written languages to convince thousands of people to mistake their imaginary forms of abstract power for something concretely real then using that abstract power to gain and exploit control authority over the entire population's resources. The modern abstract power hierarchies we live in today are derived from a similar style of ideological gatekeeping, which God Kings first mastered in early civilization. The general approach to creating and wielding abstract power appears to be largely the same as it started, at least as early as the same as it started, at least as early as 7,500 years ago. Creating abstract power can be described as a four-step process listed below and illustrated in figure 48. Step 1. Using storytelling skills, convince a population to adopt a belief system with a desired theological, philosophical, or ideological state of being. The existence of a desired state of being implicitly defines the existence of an undesired state of being, with a discrete separation between the two states of being. In this example, this discrete separation is abstracted as a gate. Step 2. Use storytelling skills to convince people there's a method, path, or gateway 
to reach the desired state of being. Step three, use storytelling skills to name yourself as the name yourself the gatekeeper who can generously lead people to through the gate to achieve the desired state of being. This is a subversive form of abstract power building, which distracts a population from seeing that you tacitly gave yourself denial of service power, which you can use to passive aggressively deny revoke people's access to the desired state of being. Step four, increase the adoption of your belief system. Here we have figure 48. The first step of creating abstract power is to use one's storytelling and rhetoric skills, applications of abstract thinking discussed in the previous section. To construct a desirable theological, philosophical, or ideological state of being and convince people it's a real thing via reification. For most of written history, this desired abstract state of being has been described as a place, a paradise of some kind, usually in the afterlife. As society becomes gradually less theological, the desirable state of being has become gradually more ideological, but equally abstract. Instead of wanting to go to heaven, for example, people often want to be moral or ethical and will hypnotize, re reify constructs like universal moral good as something concretely real. The desired state of being is often described as an all or nothing phenomenon rather than a spectrum. It's usually either zero or one. You're either in paradise or you're not. You're either moral or you aren't. It's important for the desired state to be discreetly separable, i.e. Boolean. Like this, because the creation of a discreetly true state automatically implies the existence of a discreetly false state. This way, the presence of the desired state, e.g. saved, divine, favored by the gods, moral, tacitly implies the existence of an undesirable state, e.g. not saved, not divine, not favored by the gods, immoral, as well as a discrete boundary between the two states, which subtly and passive-aggressively denies unqualified people from reaching the desired state. If we recall the discussion on a biogenesis and and passive aggressive power projection tactics like pressurized membranes and colonized attacks in the previous chapter, this is essentially an abstract version of the same power projection tactic. Once people have adopted a belief system where there are two discreetly separate states of being, i.e. good and bad, and we have convinced enough of the population to hypostatize or reify things like good and bad as concretely real things, the second step of creating and wielding abstract power is to imply there's a way to get from the undesired state to the desired state. The population must believe there's a gateway to good, otherwise it would be impossible to execute the third and probably most important step to creating abstract power. The third step to creating abstract power is to make oneself a Sherpa or gatekeeper keeper who is uniquely qualified to lead people from the undesired state e.g. bad to the desired state e.g. good by becoming the sherpa or gatekeeper a person can wield abstract power passive aggressively in the form of denial of service dos attacks moral gatekeepers implicitly have the authority to deny people's access to the population's mutually desired state of being by simply saying someone doesn't qualify for it. In other words, the person nominated to be the moral judge has the ability to judge someone as immoral and thus outcast them. As an added bonus, this tacit and passive aggressive abstract power projection tactic is easy for gatekeepers to disguise as benevolence, making it even more subversive and effective. People are quick to believe in desired states of being, e.g. moral good holy, due to theological, philosophical, or ideological reasons, and quick to see their theological, philosophical, 
or ideological gatekeepers as people who generously lead others to desired theological, philosophical, or ideological paradise. These people are oblivious to the fact that moral gatekeepers are people who tacitly wield passive-aggressive power to socially outcast anyone they choose. The point is so important that it bears repeating. To seek permission or special approval from someone is to tacitly give them abstract power over you. As soon as a population nominates someone to be their gatekeeper, they become subservient to that gatekeeper. The fourth step to creating abstract power is straightforward. Convince as many people to adopt the belief system as possible. Because it's easy to disguise the gatekeeper's passive-aggressive, hypostasized, reified, abstract power as benevolence. It's easy to motivate people to expand the reach of the gatekeeper's abstract power because they will believe they are helping their peers. Followers of any given belief system will be inclined to spread the good news that they have discovered, the path to a theological, philosophical, or ideological paradise. And all people must do to get there is do whatever the benevolent gatekeeper says to do. Pay no attention to the elephant in the room, the fact that we all hand in a person that means to psychologically exploit and abuse the population. Chapter 4.6.2 using moral ambiguity, politicking, and demagoguery to grow abstract power. As previously discussed, hypo hypostasization, reification, is often intended to be a figure of speech, but some people use it in rhetoric to convince people to reach phallus conclusions through thinly veiled logical arguments. This commonly happens in politics, when people use rhetoric to assert that something has theological, philosophical, or ideological qualities, such as moral value, and then use moral value as the logical basis for their argument. This is problematic because morals are abstract constructs, and they have no capacity to be causally efficacious and they are ontologically independent from what we currently understand to be objective reality. Moreover, it's incontrovertibly recognized that hypostatization is a fallacy when used in logical arguments. The most insidious use of hypostatization or reification, often employed by demigods, occurs when Something intended to be taken as a logical argument is disguised as a series of moral or ethically charged metaphors. This could be explained why people who seek to create abstract power often speak in metaphors. The true intent of these metaphors is to present a logical argument to persuade the audience to adopt a given belief system, for which they are the gatekeeper who decides what right is. But the logical argument is deliberately ambugated as a story or series of metaphors to either one disguise the orator's unsound and phallus logic two preemptively hedge against anticipated critical examination of the orator's logic three make a more entertaining motivating or persuasive speech or four appeal to the desires and prejudices of ordinary people Seems pretty common tactic. To illustrate the ambiguous nature of rhetoric, consider President John F. Kennedy's famous inaugural address written by Theodore Sorison, perhaps most remembered for its Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country statement. This chain of logic suggests American citizens exist for the sake of serving their government which is directly contradictory to the philosophical intent of the American Constitution and the Founding Fathers who proposed the exact opposite theory that government exists to serve the people. As previously discussed, Americans are insurrectionists, people who are overtly defiant to abstract power, dismissive of rank, disloyal to their king, capable of and highly motivated to kill thousands of redcoats to delegitimize their oppressive king's abstract power. 
the U.S. Constitution gives American citizens the right to free speech and the right to bear arms for the explicit purpose of empowering American citizens to delegitimize the abstract power of their government if it becomes too abusive or systematically exploited, just like the British monarchy did in the 1700s. Reference 91 and 100. Of course, President Kennedy was probably just being rhetorical to inspire the audience to understand the importance of civic action and public service. The point is that nobody can really know what his intentions were because of moral ambiguity. It's impossible to know whether the president was trying to inspire the audience to take civil action or he was intentionally trying to present a blatantly un-American or non-constitutional argument and passive-aggressively imply that citizens are immoral unless they devote themselves to the service of their state. Moral ambiguity is still a relevant issue today. For example, patriotism is commonly used as a form of ideological gatekeeping for the demigods to create and wield abstract power. Reference 91. Chapter 4.6.3 Signs of people exploiting or abusing their abstract powers. I will send a fully armed battalion to remind you of my love. King George III, Hamilton the Musical. Reference 21. The principles of system security apply to belief systems as much as they apply to physical system security. It is important to be aware of one's own mental models and to guard against the threat of psychological exploitation and abuse on, of one's belief system. The reader is invited to reflect on signs of theological, philosophical, or ideological gatekeeping intentional reification, politicking, moral ambiguity, demagoguery, or other examples of people trying to create abstract power so they can exploit it. There are clear signs of people trying to create and wield abstract power. People will claim that they know how to reach a paradise in the afterlife even though they can't see, smell, touch, taste, or hear it. People will claim there is an objectively moral or ethical good, even though it can't be seen, smelled, touched, tasted, or heard. People will imply there are discrete differences between heaven and hell, moral and immoral, ethical and unethical. People will imply they get to decide what behavior qualifies as moral or immoral, ethical or unethical, or worthy of heaven or hell. Then, either directly or in some passive-aggressive way, storytellers will attempt to use their rhetoric to persuade you that you are guilty of being immoral or unethical, or you are destined to go to hell because you behave the way they say you ought to behave, unless you follow some set of rules they say you have a moral obligation to follow, unless you adopt their belief system. Once you adopt these belief systems, you must understand you have tacitly given them a form of passive-aggressive abstract power over you. You have entered a permission-based belief system where you tacitly need the permission and approval of the moral gatekeepers. This is a generalized approach that humans use to create and wield abstract power over other humans by exploiting them through their abstract belief systems. This is how most abstract power-based dominance hierarchies are formed. All abstract power hierarchies introduce a psychological attack vector in the form of systemic exploitation of people's belief systems. Does this mean all abstract power hierarchies are systemically explo exploitative? Not necessarily, but it does mean that they can be systematically exploited. These types of belief systems rely on trusting in people with imaginary power. Whether or not abstract power hierarchies descend into a state of psychological exploitation and abuse depends on the population's ability to recognize the signs of it happening. Unlike the abuse of physical power, the abuse of abstract power can scale far higher, far faster, and be far harder to recognize because it doesn't have doesn't leave a blood trail. 